and welcome to the Make Code Live with me, John Park. Uh, I am really excited to be here today with another uh, sort of live coding session using Make Code. Today we're going to be using Make Code Arcade, but we're not going to be making a game. I'm actually going to use it to show how I like to prototype interfaces uh, for small handheld projects right inside of Make Code for use with things like the Pi badge here. Uh, so before I do that, actually, I'd love to check in over on the uh, Mixer chat and in the Discord. So if you are uh, joining us and you'd like to chat, we've got, uh, I know we're, we're hopefully sending out to all sorts of places, uh, including YouTube uh, and Facebook. However, the places that I'll be checking the chat are on the Microsoft Mixer page, which is mixer.com slash make code, uh, as well as the Discord, which is Adafruit's Discord. You can find it at adafruit.it slash Discord. Uh, and uh, hello, Mr. Certainly. I see Mr. Certainly is popping up over in the uh, Adafruit Discord. And I'm also going to check in on the mixer. Oh, yeah, that's right. Bruce reminds me we've got people showing up over in Twitch as well. Hello. Uh, and good, it looks like everything is, is a go. Uh, microphone level hopefully is adequate and I'm not uh, clipping. Always fun to uh, tune some of these parameters live as we go. Hey, Charles Burnerford, welcome. Uh, all right, so I don't wanna waste too much time uh, talking about the uh, inner workings of this. So let's get started. The first thing I actually wanted to do is uh, I started this last week and I'm sharing small tips and tip, tips and tricks videos uh, from members of the Make Code team. So uh, we have one right here and let's take a look. Hi, this is Abhijit. I'm a, the dev lead of the Make Code team. I've been with the team for nearly four years. I've seen the product evolve. I'm here to talk about my favorite feature. Let me share my browser. This is a hard potato program. This is a fun program where you pass a circuit playground express or CPX attached to a potato between friends in a circle. When the program times out, it's game over. Now I want to share this program with my friends. You can click on the share button at the top bar give a name, click publish, you will get a unique URL. You can use this unique URL to reach your program or your friends can load this program in from a different box and flash their CPX. It is also a QR code, Facebook sharing and Twitter sharing. What happens underneath is quite interesting as well. You send your program to the server where it is encrypted using a generated key and stored in a block storage key which is used to encrypt is sent back to you and you're the only person who can unlock this program. Even the server admins can't look at this program as it is encrypted. How cool is that? Have a good week ahead. Bye. All right, very cool tip. Uh, that is one of the things that's really uh, excellent inside of Make Code is the ability to share uh, your projects, and there's a number of ways to do it. And uh, I also didn't know that about how uh, secure and encrypted that is uh, for your share uh, shared code. So very cool. Thank you for the tip, Abhijith. And uh, I think we'll we'll keep up with those because it's nice to get some of the uh, inside scoop and inside view of things on Make Code. Uh, all right, so today what I wanted to do, like I said, is talk about how you can use the Make Code Arcade, not for necessarily a, a game, but for building an interface for a, a small project. So uh, let's start off with a little bit of a demo, actually. I'm going to uh, pop over to this little webcam I have here. And what you'll see is I've got a uh, Pi badge and this Pi badge is displaying three sets of numbers. I can use the select button on the Pi badge to switch between the top, middle, and lower sets of numbers. Each time I press select, I'm just cycling through those. 
And what these represent are the red, green, and blue values of the LEDs that you see down below, as well as a set that I have uh, of external LEDs or NeoPixels sitting here inside of a little diffusing box. So what I'll do is use uh, my selector. Let's, let's make it blue, how about? So I'm gonna use my selector to go down to the blue setting. And then each time I tap up or down, I'm adding uh, 20 to the total value, which can go up to 255. But I decided I didn't wanna go in little one uh, increments, single digit increments. So we're going up by tens. And you can see here, I got a nice strong blue happening. And you can also see there's a little glow coming from this box of, of NeoPixels off to the side. Uh, and now what I'll do is I'll mix in, how about some red into that to make it more of a pinkish color. So you can see as I add in, you can probably see the lighting in my glasses here and on my face too, it's pretty bright lighting. Uh, I can adjust the uh, color mix there. And what I've also done is set these uh, D-pad left and right buttons to adjust the brightness. So this is gonna go down and this is gonna go up. Oh, we've cycled around, so we got back down to, to dark. Uh, and what I did here is I decided to only send the updated brightness to the strip when I press the A button uh, for no particular reason other than just because we can and to, to try out uh, some other interface settings. So you see when I get it down to nothing uh, and then send it over to the LEDs, it will respond. And same thing uh, now with, with color, uh, as you noticed before, I have that happening in real time between both the onboard LEDs and with the strips. So here we'll add in a bunch of green and maybe take out the, the blue entirely. And we can go to the red, drop that down. Now we got a pure green, or we can get more of a yellow color by dialing a lot of red and a lot of green. Uh, so that's the idea behind the project. And you can see here, I'm using some game-like elements in that I have these button inputs and I have uh, some nice display graphics here and I'm using the onboard NeoPixels as well as this connector here, which goes out to my external strip uh, that's sitting in the box, just so you can see what that thing is. It's a, it's a box of LEDs. It's very bright. It's a bright cube, uh, especially in that camera. It'll get a little overexposed. Um, so let's pull this back here. And now let's take a look at um, some of the elements that I used in order to uh, program this and Let's pop over to this um, make code session here. So this is a blank session. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build some of the elements to show you separately how they work. And then we'll take a look at the full program that I created that's running the, the uh, NeoPixels on this. Um, so first of all, here in Arcade, I've gone ahead and under the gear icon, once you create your session, we can click on this change board if we need to and pick the board that we're using. Uh, and you can change your mind later, but I'm gonna go ahead and pick this Pi badge. Uh, and now that will allow me to easily upload, oh, there it tried, tried to upload. Uh, it'll allow me easily upload to uh, that board when we have it connected over web USB. Um, and now let's take a look at some extensions that I'm using. So we're used to typically going in on Arcade and creating a sprite of some kind as a character. Um, thankfully, I'm not having to do that to create the graphics in this case because there's an extension that makes it very easy for me to create that seven segment type. Uh, and when I say extension, if you look in the interface under this advanced section and open this up, down at the bottom is this extensions. And you can think of extensions as additional chunks of code that are easy to use that have a lot of new functionality. So uh, for example, I've been mentioning the seven segment. Here it is, the seven segment digit display. It looks like an old uh, LCD clock. And if I click on that, what happens is this uh, category called seven seg gets added to my uh, blocks that I can use and the code that I can use. So that didn't exist before. That's a sort of a library or as we're calling it an extension of additional functions. There are a couple other extensions I'll add, but first let's just take a look at uh, how the seven segment display uh, blocks work. So 
there are two different types of seven segment displays that we can create. There are counters and there are digits. And what we're using in this case is a counter. So a counter is very easy to use. Uh, the digits have a little more flexibility, but in this case, what we're using it for is a counter uh, type of functionality. So I'll go ahead and add this set my counter to create counter. Uh, and you'll see over on my simulator now, this counter with a zero in it has shown up. And we'll notice inside of this creation block, there's a little plus sign, which means we can do a little more with this. It's always good to check out what's inside those plus signs. Uh, here we have uh, three things that we can, we can do. We can change the uh, style of the letters. So there's thick, there's these little thin ones. Uh, I think I ended up using medium. So you can pick from those. Um, we can adjust the uh, size, either a full size or a half size. Half size is nice if you're using this as like a little counter up at the top of the screen, but we're gonna go full size. We're using these big, huge display numbers. And how many digits is it gonna be? Let's go up to three digits with this. And so you, you can see now we have the seven segment display made for us with a zero, zero, zero. Now, in order to uh, change what the value is of the seg seven segment display, we're gonna go back to the seven seg category and now you can see after the creation, uh, there are some additional blocks that we'll wanna grab. One is the set the counter display color. Uh, and the other is this change the counter, either set it to a particular number or add to or subtract from the number. So first thing I'll do is just take in this counter color, set my counter display color, and we'll change that. How about to green? After this updates, you'll see we have a little green counter in there now. And then we'll go back to the categories and I'm gonna pull in a uh, initial starting number. So we'll grab this set my counter count to, uh, and you can also uh, adjust the X and Y position on the screen with this block. It's, it's sometimes a little confusing. There are some hidden functions, but we'll start off with just the count. Uh, we'll, we'll set this to have about 127, arbitrarily selected number. And now if I wanna change where this appears on the screen, I'll go back to uh, either go back to the categories here and grab that same block again, or I can duplicate the block that exists on screen. So remember this when you're uh, working with make code, if you wanna speed things up a little bit, sometimes look and see if you can copy and paste or duplicate blocks that exist already. So I've just duplicated that just by right clicking and picking duplicate. And now rather than setting my counter value, I'm gonna set the X and you'll see this is gonna move uh, over to the right. I'll leave it there. That's kind of a nice place for it. And then I'll duplicate it one more time and I'll change the Y position. This is right on top of my head now. Uh, so we'll set the Y value. Um, let's see, that's a little low. How about we'll put it up near the top? How about 12 units down? So it'll be in the upper right corner. Oh, that's not... Uh, <laughs> That's not low enough, so I guess it's measured from the center uh, of that of that object. So we'll change this uh, about 32. This should be low enough. There we go. Okay, so now we've got it positioned. Uh, it's kind of our starting point. Let's take a look now at how you can adjust the value of that. So we'll make a very simple um, input. Let's use our controller on button A. So this is a good way to test things. Even if you're gonna use something else later, I like to just grab the, uh, the click button A. When it's pressed, what I wanna do is add one digit, uh, make it simple, add one digit or one uh, unit value to what the count is. So I'll go back to seven seg and I'll pick the change counter count by one. And here we go, whenever we press the A button, I'll come over here to the simulator and click on A, it goes up. Now for a um, second secondary uh, button, let's go ahead and add in the B button. So I can, again, either go back to inputs and grab the B button press, or I can duplicate this one and change it to be the B button. You'll see right now it ghosts it out, which means we can't use that block 
twice. It doesn't make sense. We, we can only have one um, block that is based on the button A input, but we can change that to the B button with this little drop down here. And you can see there you've got uh, a set of the different controls that you can um, use. So up, down, left, right, the menu button, A and B, or any button. So this is now going to be when we press the B button, how about we'll subtract one from the count. And I can do that just by changing it by negative one. So I've just picked in this field, typed in a negative one. And now you can see when the program starts, it always goes to 127 because that's what we told it to in the startup block. And now I can add to or subtract from by pressing those buttons. Um, okay, so that's the first element. Um, so we know how to create the counter. We can set the color of it. We can move it around on screen. Uh, and we know how to adjust its value. And it does all of the hard stuff for us. So it automatically updates uh, as that variable changes. Um, what I end up doing in the red, green, blue is I want to have three of these. So you can imagine we could simply duplicate all of these blocks uh, and make two more sets of them and change their colors. Uh, or as you'll see, when we look at the full program, I decided to make some uh, functions for these to do the setup uh, sort of in their own little discrete blocks so that I don't end up with a mile long uh, my start block. Um, okay, so the next thing I wanna do is add the ability to control the lights, the NeoPixels. So there are a couple other extensions I'm gonna add. We'll head back down to extensions. And there is a extension here called Light, which is programmable LEDs, WS2812s, APA102. So these are what uh, Adafruit, we call these NeoPixels and dot stars. Might be used to those names. So what I'll do now after adding in that um, Light extension is I'll look back into the category. Usually when you add a, a an extension, it's a good idea to then look in the categories and see what's been changed, if, if anything. And in this case, we now have this light block and we have this more section on the light block. So we can deal with onboard strips, which in the case of the Pi badge here, you can see down below, has these little five uh, NeoPixels down at the bottom. And we can also deal with external strips uh, which are this block here, set strip to create WS2812 strip on LED with 30 pixels. So that, let me grab that, talk about that one for a moment. Uh, what that one is saying is we can create an external NeoPixel strip, which if you look here, I've got uh, this strip of LEDs, too bright to look at. I've got a strip of LEDs inside of this diffusing box and they are plugged into a port. Let me go down to this view here for a second. So they're plugged into this port here, which is listed as D2. So that is the second digital pin on this microcontroller. So the, the controller chip right there has digital pins that we can use for input and output. And I want to be able to use that one to control the external NeoPixel strip. So right now, when we create this new strip, we can tell it which pin are we going to plug into. And the choices right now are not sufficient for what I'm trying to do. I have some pins, the LED pin, SDA, SCL, MISO, MOSI, RX, TX. OK, uh, so how do I get access to these other pins? The answer is yet another extension. So I'm gonna head down to extensions. And this one happens to be in an extension called Feather. And the reason for that is that the Pi badge uses the Feather um, header and uh, pinout, or similar to the, it's pretty much the, the Feather pinout, which is another microcontroller board. Um, and that's the name, that was done first, so that's the name that they're under. Uh, but what happens is when I add that um, extension, now I get a whole bunch of other pins that I can use. And so the one I want here is D2. 
Uh, and what that means now is we can go ahead and do other NeoPixel things that will um, light up the LEDs on that strip that's plugged into the D2 pin. Um, so I think those are the only extensions that we need now. And I wanna show you a kind of neat tip, which is it's not always obvious which extensions you've added if some of them are a little bit buried in the menus here. Uh, one thing you can do is head to the JavaScript mode and over in, so, so the way I've switched there is up at the top, we have blocks and JavaScript. So I've switched to the JavaScript tab and over under the simulator, you'll see there's this drop down menu called Explorer. And when I open that up and scroll down, I'm gonna see, generally speaking, the extensions are the ones that you can get rid of. So they have a little trash can next to them. Um, and there may be a much smarter way to do this, but this is how I usually do it. So now I can see I've added seven seg, I've added the light and I've added the feather. Those are the three extensions that I've added. Okay, so just a little tip there in case you're ever wondering what's, uh, what's in a program uh, that's been added beyond the core That'll show you. Uh, okay, so now something else that I, I wanted to show you, which is uh, sort of on the sneaky tricks side of things, uh, which, which I always like, I'm a fan of. Um, you'll notice when I wanna change the position of the counter, this block is not as helpful as the sprites block. So if I bring in a sprites block, a regular sprite, and we'll even give it a little uh, icon on screen. I'm just gonna put a little plus sign. Okay, so now you'll see there's a little plus sign on the screen there. When I add in my positioning block for that sprite, this one's really cool because it has not only a slider for X and a slider for Y, but it even has this really nice graphical um, menu or, or graphical interface for being able to place the position of something with a little drag and, and click. So uh, what I decided to do was hijack that, that uh, functionality and use it for placing my counter, which doesn't have that. Counter just has these uh, number entry fields. And so the way I'm gonna do this is I'll, I'll leave the names default for now. So my sprite, position X and position Y, what I wanna do is I just want to uh, essentially make the seven segment display a child of that. So it'll follow its parent around. And, and that's a term that's used in, um, in graphics often to talk about hierarchies. So the parent moves, the child is gonna move with it. And so uh, the way I'll do this is instead of setting my counter X and my counter Y to just be these numbers, I can set them to be the answer to the question of where is this my sprite X and where is this my sprite Y? Uh, that uh, question is answered in this block. If I head over to sprites and right here towards the top, we have my sprite X and there's a drop down, which means there's probably my sprite Y under there as well. So I'm gonna drag that out and I'm gonna place that right into what was the number field. And now my, you'll see this will update, my counter has moved on X over to the exact spot as the sprite. I'll duplicate that block and I'll place it in the Y and change its drop down to the Y. And now you'll see wherever my sprite is, that's where the counter is gonna be. And I've used this trick before for some other uh, in games. Uh, I think if you, if you ever check out the uh, Trash Panda game, uh, that one also I used some of this sort of trickery to make it easier to follow some things that had nicer controls. Um, and last thing we'll do here is I'm just gonna set this sprite to not look like anything um, because I don't, wanna, I don't wanna be looking at it. So I'll grab a uh, eraser or use the pencil tool with a blank. And the size of this doesn't matter. We could make it zero, zero, or one, one if we want. Uh, but now you'll see, even though that sprite doesn't look like anything, it's a really useful control for positioning my sprite. Um, and 
that would also, I actually haven't tried this, but this, this, this should work and should be fun. Uh, that should mean that I can now control the position of my counter using the D-pad. It has nothing to do with this project, but I'm dying to check. So I'm gonna grab the controller uh, category, say move my sprite with buttons. And I can set that right here. And now this means we should be able to, oh, it's not working, why is that? Uh, oh, because I'm never updating. Okay, that's all right, we can fix that. So we'll, we'll just set a forever block, go back to loops forever. And I'll just duplicate these two uh, so that on setup, we position the seven segment display right on top of the little crosshair there that I've made invisible. But the setup loop only runs one time at the startup. So now what happens is this forever loop should allow me to move that, uh, that around. That's kind of fun. And nothing will stop it from going off screen right now. It'll just drive right off since we haven't told it to stay on screen. But uh, let me use my, my arrow keys. That'll be a little easier for me. So there, we've got uh, the makings of a screensaver, sort of a little bouncing clock thing. Um, so that's a trick that you can use for any block that has the ability to specify its X and Y location, but doesn't have some of the more advanced functionality of sprites. So we could have this bounce. We could have it do animation. Um, trajectory animations and those kinds of things. All right, um, and let me think if there's any other uh, of these general um, processes that I'm using to set this, uh, set this up. So let's jump over for a moment to the, the full completed code. Um, and, I'll, and I'll kind of talk you through some of the things here that are, that are allowing us to set this up. So, uh, first, I mentioned that I have, rather than lots of code replicated inside of this on start block, I'm using three functions. So if you'll remember when I take a, when I want to take a bunch of code and uh, kind of organize it off to the side and just call it all at once when I need it, I use the uh, functions down here in the advanced section. I can create a function. So I created these blue, red, and green setup functions. Uh, if we look at those, here's the red one. Um, I am using this to set my uh, counter to uh, follow around my, my little uh, positioning block, like I mentioned before. Uh, I'm setting the position of that little invisible positioner. And then I'm doing that creation. Remember these uh, medium segment, full size, and how many digits. Setting the position. Uh, and setting its display color. So it's very similar to what we did over here um, at the beginning of this loop, but instead we're putting that all inside of a function. Uh, after those are called, I'm creating the NeoPixel strips. So I'm actually doing it twice. The first one is the onboard strip, and the second one is, remember I showed how that feather header, that D2 feather header works. Um, so that's where that one is coming from. And then I'm setting the brightness of those. Uh, and then we start into the variables. So we're gonna use variables and we're gonna use a, uh, some lists and some comparisons to do a lot of the work for us. So uh, I have a picker, which is the first, second, or third of those blocks. And I'm calling them zero, one, and two. Um, so I'm setting that pick variable to be zero. Uh, and this is a white, a little off-white uh, border, and that's what you see surrounding the first um, item. And so whenever I click this menu button, and that happens to be the select button on, uh, on this, this board. This one that says select, similar to like a Nintendo select and start are the two uh, sort of function buttons. Um, so, that moves this little uh, selector. And whenever I move that, I'm actually moving uh, to a prepared set of locations on screen. So I didn't want it sort of 
sloppily driving around and trying to find my position. Uh, so I created an array of 20, 60, and 100 uh, just through trial and error, figuring out where on the y-axis this thing could be. So those are the three positions that that can be. Uh, and I also have a list for the, the values of those three um, different seven segment displays. Now, when I press the menu button, uh, you can see I'm changing that pick variable uh, to the next number. So it starts at zero, and then it's going to add one to that. Uh, and then since I, I've shown this before, but since I want that number to only loop through 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, I use this remainder of that number divided by 3. So it's always going to be 0, 1, or 2. Even as the number gets bigger and bigger and bigger, I'm always then returning it back to 0, 1, and 2. Um, when that uh, number has been changed back into 0, 1, or 2, we then set the picker, which is the name I gave to this little rectangle, uh, its Y value, so up and down on screen, to one of the three values that I preset up here. Let me move these guys closer together for a second. Get this out of the way. So you can see here, that is how these relate to each other. So the uh, array of the picker Y list I can get a value at zero, which is the first item in the list. That's going to return a 20. Next time I click it, it's going to ask for the first, the item one rather in the list. It's actually the second item. Uh, so item one value is 60. And then item two value, the third one, is a 100. And so that's how we're presetting those numbers. You can see here, um, if I change those, how about we'll make this 30, uh, 50, 120. Now when it restarts, every time I click menu, it goes between those three numbers. So that's where that list is created. And it's a nice way to just store some presets uh, for you. So I'm going to hit undo. I'm pressing control Z on the keyboard. Or you can use the little back, uh, back arrow here. And now we're back to the expected behavior there. Uh, now the Next functionality we want to look at is how are we adjusting the brightness, or uh, rather the, the color. Um, so if I take a look at what happens when I press the up button, so here you'll see that's raising the value by 10 of whichever one I have picked. Or it subtracts if I go down. So let's look at this up, how this up button works. So um, I'm going to get this over near my start block. I'm going to zoom out a bit. Oh, there we go. Uh, so you can see here, uh, when the up button gets pressed, the first thing I'm doing is setting the current count value to uh, the counter list of whichever pick we're on and the count value of that. What does all that mean? So same as before, I have this list of 0, 1, or 2, and I keep flipping between them. So I need to essentially check which one are we on? What's the state? Uh, which one are we, we on right now? So if I look at uh, this backwards, I can say I'm getting the count for, let's say, pick 0, because that's the one we're on right here. Uh, pick 0 from the counter list, which is this up here in the start block is an array of the red counter, the green counter, or the blue counter. So that's how I know which counter we're, we're asking for at this point. Um, and then we're setting the current count value to that value. So red counter, green counter, or blue counter, their values are uh, originally created in these setups. Uh, they originally start out at 0, 0, 0. Um, and as those are changing, they're stored in their own um, variable per counter. So uh, when I've pressed the up that button, I've gotten that number, then I increase it by 10. So this just changes this, this uh, current count value by 10. Uh, then we set the current count value to a remainder of 10 divided by 260. And that's because again, I wanna go from zero to 250 uh, and loop back around because the maximum uh, color value of any of the color components is 255, and we're going by tens. 
Uh, and then the last thing we do is we actually set the counter to that new number. So all of this is to create a, a value and then this set counter list uh, get value at pick count to current count value um, actually tells the uh, counter object, the seven segment display object that is currently picked what its number should be. Um, so how does that change the color of the RGB? What, what, what that's really doing right now is just setting uh, that number, let's say to 30. So how is that getting sent to the NeoPixel? Uh, what I have for that is actually a uh, on-game update, which is very similar to the forever block. Um, so if we look at put this, I'm feeling trapped by the blocks. Uh, so if we look at this, I'll zoom out just a little because it's kind of a long one. On game update is a update that happens on every tick of the internal game clock, which is very, very fast. Sub, sub millisecond, I think uh, it updates. And so uh, <clears throat> every time it updates, we set every pixel on the red, uh, sorry, we set every pixel. So in the case of the um, Pi badge, that's the five pixels here. And on the case of my NeoPixel strip that's in that box, there's 30 of them. So we do essentially the same thing twice. Uh, the first time through, we're setting every pixel to be red, whatever the value of the counter for the red counter is, green, whatever the value of the green counter is, and blue, whatever the value of the blue counter is. And then we just run through and do that exact same thing a second time, uh, except that's for that external strip that's plugged in. Um, so. Essentially, this means that they change in real time as the as the values change. So just to look again uh, briefly at the the real thing, if I drop that red component, and I could make these repeating probably <laughs> instead of uh, having to tap them over and over. So now I've got uh, every time I update, every pixel updates to all of those colors. So I'm taking the green mostly out, and then I'll let's add in the blue. So get kind of a nice blue color. Um, so that's how the um, counter number changing, which is what I'm changing directly, then kind of goes and indirectly change changes the NeoPixel colors. Um, so let's see. The um, I mentioned before, just sort of to, to try it out, I have the color updating continuously as soon as I change it. But I wanted to also try out what if I want to adjust a value but only update it when I ask. So I can kind of page through some values and say go, apply that to the external strip. And that's how I'm using the brightness control. So if we look at um, the A and B, or rather the B button and the left and right buttons, let me put those together. Uh, here's my B, oh yeah, there's the A and the B, okay. And let me go find left and right, where'd you go? I think it's these little guys here, yeah. A future update to, uh, wish list item I have for a, a future update to uh, make code would be multi-select, the ability to sort of drag a a big group of blocks at one time. I don't think I know of a way to do that. Um, so if we look here, what's happening when I change left and right is really similar to what happens when I change the color with up and down. Uh, I change a, a value called brightness by 10. I set the brightness to the remainder of the brightness divided by 260. So that again allows me to loop uh, from zero to 250. And then I just set the brightness to bright. Now brightness is only going to apply to my onboard NeoPixels. So if I look at the light, uh, where'd the light category go? There you are. There you are. Uh, so this set brightness applies to the onboard NeoPixel strip, but down here under more, I have set the strip brightness, and that's the one I'm using for the external strip. Uh, so this means I'm just changing that in real time. As soon as I adjust, it changes the onboard NeoPixels. Uh, the way that I'm sort of delaying 
the update of the NeoPixel strip is over here in the A and B buttons. I actually have, I forgot I, I put this. I have the B button actually just turns the brightness on the external strip to zero. So that effect, effectively turns it off. And when I press A, I then update that, that brightness. So let's, let's take a look at another demo on um, the overhead cam. I'll get this uh, block into, into view here. Uh, if I start hitting the right button, let me get these, you'll see the brightness is changing on the, on the NeoPixels on board. Oops, there we go. If I hit the B button, it sets the external strip to zero brightness. If I hit the A button, it changes it to the same brightness level. So you can see here, the changes are real time on the onboard strip and they only happen when I ask for the update with the A button or I can turn it right off. Uh, so hopefully you can imagine how that um, all could be used for different types of interfaces. It doesn't even have to be NeoPixels, but I think the uh, one of the exciting things for me is the ability to use uh, any of these hardware um, essentially the arcade hardware controllers, uh, such as the, there's the Meow Bit, uh, there's the Pi Gamer, there's the Pi Badge, there's a, a handful of others. Um, they can serve as some pretty sophisticated user interfaces for things like remote control vehicles. I've seen them used for that. Uh, I've seen it used with things like um, external sensors, if you wanna read sensors and go through different pages of, of items on there. Uh, you can do a whole heck of a lot, and, and the interface can get pretty sophisticated. I've, I've done projects where I've made little icons and different pages of icons and uh, hover overs to change colors. So you can do an incredibly uh, sophisticated interface right, on right inside of Make Code Arcade, and it's not necessarily a game, but uh, there's, I think you can see there's a lot of similarities between how... Uh, using these blocks to design game elements and using them to design non-game types of, uh, of microcontroller uh, projects are pretty closely related and, and transferable skills. Uh, let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll pop out and check if there are any questions over in the chats and I'll also check and see if there's any other um, uh, functions in this code that we want to talk about. Let's see, Hypebot says Microsoft Store is now auto-hosting you. I don't know what that is. I'm such a newbie to, to Mixer that I don't know what auto-hosting is, but uh, cool, I suppose. Um, and let's see, yeah, no questions over in uh, uh, Adafruit Discord. That's great. So let's see, any other... Uh, you can see here's there's some convenience things I'm doing just to show you how they're done that you don't necessarily need to do, but this one's kind of cool. If you forget how wide the screen is that you're using uh, and you want to put something halfway, for example, you don't need to know necessarily what the number of pixels is because there's a screen width item here. I think I got that out of uh, game. No, scene. Yeah, scene. There's screen width and screen height. So... Since I wanted to set that uh, set of blocks right in the middle, uh, I can simply set those on their X axis to be the screen width divided by two. Um, if we change this, you'll see how about divided by three, we'll see that the white picker box is now offset over to the side um, or a quarter of the way and so on. So uh, that's a, a, a nice trick, a nice convenience uh, there. I think the answer is 120 because this is a 240 pixel wide by 240 pixel wide screen, but no, is it? Yeah, see, I've forgotten what is, I don't remember what the dimensions are on the screen anymore. Is it 180? 241? I don't know what it is. I think it's a four by three ratio. Does anyone know? I've suddenly, I've suddenly forgotten. Um, we could probably figure that out actually by just by querying that value, uh, make a little graph of it or, or set the in fact, here let's 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 try something uh, in our other session. We'll go to uh, the counter here, and I'll set the counter value to be uh, screen width one sixty. There we go. And what's the screen height? 
let's go back to scene. Just place that. 120, there we go, 160 by 120. <laughs> See, there's, a, there's another really useful function of those, is just answer, answer the question for me. Uh, let's see, what else? I think that is most of, uh, most of the, the clever stuff that's going on here. Uh, some of it you can see is just repetitions, like these functions, red, green, and blue are essentially doing the same things. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. So, so really one of, the, one of the fundamentals here that I find to be really useful is coming to terms with lists, uh, being able to use uh, the lists, which live, uh, live down here in arrays rather, uh, using these arrays to store things and retrieve them and say which of, of the three I'm, I'm grabbing and going back to them a lot. Uh, really makes life a lot easier uh, and allows you to simplify your code versus such as you might use big if else statements to say which one I'm on and so on. But uh, I, I like using those lists as a way to query the information for the three items in this case. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, questions. Oh, TJ Chewy asks Minecraft. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I, I thought I had changed the... Uh, the setting of our what game this is to not be a game. I think I had set it to make code, but maybe it rejected that. So uh, good news is TJ Chu, you can use make code, any of these skills you learn transferred using make code with Minecraft. So uh, there are some other um, videos on the, the make code channel uh, dedicated to making with Minecraft. So you might want to check those out. Uh, but sorry for the, uh, the misrepresentation. I did not mean to lie to you. It just happened. Uh, all right. So I think that wraps it up. Uh, thank you for, for coming by. I'll give, uh, one last demo here of, of the real thing. How about, uh, here is my color picker, which I'm very happy with. It allows you to, uh, come up with colors you like and then find out what their RGB values are or vice versa. If you know a red, green, blue, value, you can type it right in uh, very easily uh, and then use that for other projects or just simply use it as a, as a lighting controller. So that is going to wrap it up. That is the, uh, what did I call this? The NeoPixel control counter thinger, thinger. Uh, for Microsoft's Make Code. This has been Make Code Live. I'm John Park, and I will see you next week. I do this every Tuesday uh, at this time, which is noon Pacific and three o'clock Eastern. Uh, and if you're interested in this content, I also do a Make Code Minute section during my Adafruit uh, John Park's workshop live stream, which is on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific and 4 p.m. Eastern time. And we also have a lot of other content on Adafruit that ends up uh, showing, uh, showing off great projects using Make Code, as well as lots of other things, uh, hardware and software-wise. Uh, so thank you very much, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.